Welcome back, students of the Word. It is Matthew 23 today. I'm so glad that I'm back with you because I think God's got something really, really special for us today. And we get to Matthew 23, it's the famous whoa chapter. It has nothing to do with horses. It has everything to do with curses. And yet it has everything to do with our heart. As we get ready to go here, there's three passages I want you to keep in mind. We're going to be referring shortly, but back to Leviticus 21 and 22. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> there's a reason there, and we're going to come to it, but we're not really, we're going to just kind of reference it because it sets us up. We're going to be also looking back to Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to see some things there. And then, of course, today's with Matthew 23. This is going to be some interesting stuff and it has everything to do with our righteousness. Jesus is really concerned with our righteousness, but he picks up where he left off in Matthew 22. He is just, well, he's teaching during Holy Week. He's on the Temple Mount. He's interacting, and he's just silenced the, fair, or the Sadducees. He silenced the Sadducees on the question of the resurrection. Shut them down. And from here on out, he has nothing whatsoever to do with them. That has impact as we move into the rest of the events of Holy Week. And he's been debating with the Pharisees on the greatest commandment and on the Messiah. And he silenced them because they don't know what to do with the fact that they've been, come face to face with everything that is truth from Scripture. So he's pointed out all of their hypocritical questioning where they've been trying to trap him rather than hear him. And then they kind of drift away and Jesus addresses the crowd. Notice how he starts out in Matthew 21 then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples. And he pulls them in. And Wearsby calls these, these next couple verses how he addresses the false concept of righteousness. And I think it's very important for us to take a look at verses 2 and 3. The scribes and the Pharisees are seated in the chair of Moses. Therefore, do. Now, hang on here. Make this happen. He is absolutely saying, do whatever they tell you and definitely observe it. This is a long-term commitment. He is telling you that what they tell you is truth, and you're called to observe it. But stop doing. Don't do. Right now, stop doing what they do because they don't practice what they teach there's something important that we've got to understand here as Jesus is debating with the Sadducees and the Pharisees and talking to the crowd. There's about 6,000 Pharisees at the time of Jesus, according to what scholars think. Uh, nobody really knows for sure because there's no, no real hard data that way, but it's a guess. And these that are part of the Pharisees, the Pharisees were to be separate. It was a renewal movement, and they took their name from the Hebrew word, which means to separate. But they were concerned that we get back to the truth of the word and get back to the Old Testament covenant. That's why Leviticus 21 and 22 are so important. Back in the revived school meetings in Indiana, Pastor Gordy Hankey, who we've been listening to uh, this week, but also we get to hear him uh, once, once a month up in Indiana, highlighted that in Leviticus, what happened to them can happen to us today, the applying of rules versus principles. They took the principles of Leviticus 21 and 22 and camped out on them. They made them the end game, the end be all and end all, as opposed to the starting point to get us to the inward heart relationship. And so they held on to the rules. And as the generations went on and went down, they kept building on that to the point that they forgot about the heart. It was all about getting to the place where we're at the heart relationship. And Jesus is understanding this. And so he is addressing and he talks about the Pharisees and scribes. 
and telling you to do whatever they tell you and observe it because they did have the truth. They just missed the heart of the matter and they had moved so far away from it. He doesn't deal with the Sadducees at all because they don't have truth. Even as hard as this chapter is, and some, uh, I, I, I cracked up at some of the uh, descriptions of this scathing denunciation or angry castigation by Jesus of the Pharisees. It is about the fact he absolutely loves them. He knows they have truth. They're just missing the heart of it. And that's why this chapter is so incredibly important for us as students of the word, as followers of Jesus Christ. And we need to live into that. Because these Pharisees, where they had gotten to at this point, and let me highlight this, they're not all missing the point. Some are mentioned because they are so close to Jesus, and they actually become followers. Nicodemus, in John chapter 3, John chapter 7, verses 50 to 53, he becomes a follower of Christ, or at least asking about Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea, John chapter 19 and verses 38 and following, he is engaged with Jesus. Many of the Pharisees became followers, or at least some of them. Enough of them because they were close to the truth and they saw the truth that Jesus was bringing. But the rest of them, so close and yet so far, and he had been trying to bring them in to fellowship and understanding of what righteousness with God really entails but they had moved far away from it. Wearsby calls verse 4 that they had a false concept of ministry. They tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. Jesus said, I'm here to lighten their load. And the legalistic religion, focusing on all the externals, not getting to the heart, just make burdens heavier. Verses 5 to 12. Wearsby says it, this is a false concept of greatness. They do everything to be observed by others. They enlarge their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. We dealt with the phylacteries. Let's go back to that verse 5. Because they dealt with our, the phylacteries back in the Pentateuch. We talked about that a great deal. This is the only time, the only mention of phylacteries in the New Testament. They got them bigger. And then the, the tassels were these blue and white cords worn on the outer garments later on the prayer shawl, to remind them of all that God has done, how he's redeemed them, and to remember his commandments. But some of them got so that they would lengthen the tassels because the more noticeable the tassels, the more spiritual they seemed. And notice how they love the place, in verse 6, they love the place of honor at banquets, the front seats in the synagogue. I want those saved seats. I want to be honored and love before you miss out on this, the love that they have here, it's phileo. It's not agape. There's no sacrificial love here. It's about them. And then they move on. They like greetings in the marketplace. They like to constantly and repeatedly be called rabbi by the people. Not just once, all the time. Come on, give me my name. Don't, let, don't, don't forget who I am. But as for you, don't be called rabbi because you have one teacher and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father because you have one father who is in heaven. And do not, do not be called masters either because you have one master, the Messiah. Now, liter, le, legitimate use of these terms is fine. Jesus is pointing out the hypocrisy of it. He's pointing out the overbearingness of it and how it was based on their own greatness as opposed to the relationship. You know, we have to have... the. It, we're in relationship with the Father, the Heavenly Father, the whole connection to the Father. And in the family of God, uh, our congregation has heard me say this time after time, once it got embedded in my heart, there are no cousins in the family of God. We're brothers and sisters. We keep wanting to try to distance everybody else, but we're in this together. And he's saying, look, you're in family. You're in relationship. Quit setting yourself up to be something that you're not. Why? Verse 11. The greatest among you will be your servant. Has he been reinforcing that all the way through this part of Matthew? Absolutely. You have to compare this to almost identical wording to what I was actually getting to teach about in Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 to 28. The greatest was the person who stooped to serve. And they all missed that. Because, verse 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. He's been saying this to the crowds and the disciples. 
The Pharisees had wandered away, but you kind of wonder, had they come back? Had they been hearing some of this and drifted back? Because it, it is a good-sized area on the Temple Mount, but it's not that far away, and maybe they were coming back because Jesus is going to point to them. And you never know when, when, that, when that verbiage comes back and you don't know who's, who's listening. Last trip to Jerusalem. And we're in Israel, and we're before the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and we're talking about how Jesus sacrificed himself for us. Jesus the Jew. Little be known to us, there's this guy from Bethlehem, a Palestinian, who's listening, and he goes, no, no, that's not right. Jesus wasn't a Jew. He was an Arab. No, he was a Jew. And we got to tell him more about Yeshua in ways that he did not know before. So be ready those that are listening. And so Jesus starts into these seven woes. And this is going to be fun because, uh, I, again, I point out Warren Wearsby because he did this, and then I found another one that talked about there is a correlation between Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount and Matthew 23 with these woes. And I want you to see this, this connection that we've got here. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Notice Sadducees aren't mentioned at all. You lock up the kingdom of heaven from people, for you don't go in and you don't allow those entering to go in. Take a look at this. Take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Because here is entering the kingdom. And in Matthew 23, in this woe, the poor in spirit are blessed, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They get to go in. But what's Matthew 23? You shut up the kingdom. Notice the correlation. I want you to see this as we go through here. And this just struck my heart. This part of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is also addressing the Pharisees. He's saying, you have the opportunity. Here you are right now. You have the opportunity to get to the heart, to get away from the externals to the heart of the relationship. And he gives these beatitudes. Who are you blessed? You know, I, I, I was looking at, at Mindy's painting, and it was striking me the green that was in the roots. And I don't know what she was doing with that, but the, I just sense this element of the nutrients, what's coming from the, the heart of the root. It's not about the externals. The tree dies if it's just on the outside, but it has to have that on the inside. And Jesus has been pointing this out, and he points to them in, in Matthew chapter 5. And here in Matthew 23, he's saying, you didn't listen to me. You're still as bad off, and this is the result of what it's doing to the people of God, whom you love, you really do, but you're, you're, you're missing the point. And I love them so much, and I'm grieving over this. And he speaks the truth in love to the Pharisees. He doesn't get spineless in speaking his love. He really targets in. And we're going to see why that's so important and why he's really speaking out of love in the midst of this. If you look at Matthew chapter 4, he says, those who mourn are blessed. They will be comforted. That's totally different from verse 14, where he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You devour widows' houses and make long prayers just for show. This is why you will receive harsher punishment. So in Matthew, he says, look, mourners are comforted. But no, notice here, mourners are comforted, but destroyers are condemned. Now, for you students, if you'll notice, if your translation has verse 14, it's in brackets of, of Matthew 23. Others of you, it just doesn't have verse 14. This shouldn't scare you. It should just tell you that there is something about this particular verse that we need to find out. This verse is not found in the earliest of manuscripts. They keep finding manuscripts that are older. And so as a, an element of authenticity, of, of, of understanding, of uh, accountability, they put it in brackets or they take it out because it's not in the earliest manuscripts. You need to know that because some people will point that out saying, oh, this is wrong. No, it's not wrong. They thought they had it. And here's why they put it in there because this woe is found in Mark chapter 12, verse 40, and it's found in Luke chapter 20, verse 47. So 
Did it get added later? I don't know. That's why you'll find some lists that say seven woes. Some will find eight woes. There's just a lot of woe woes. And for those of you in Fort Wayne, you'll love that part. Anyhow, moving right along, because there's more here. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, take a look who's blessed. The gentle are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. So the meek, oops, get the right color. Right? I'm going to get also the meek inherit the earth. What happens on the other side? Matthew 23, verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as fit for hell as you are. The proud send souls to hell. I, I picked the colors just so you know as I'm doing this. If you happen to be watching the video, I'm writing the Sermon on the Mount in green because it was on the Sermon on the Mount. It was up in Galilee. The Mount was probably green. There was grass in Galilee. I'm using yellow for Matthew 23 because Jesus is pointing out the sin nature. So in, con in consistency with all of this, I just thought, hey, those are the right colors to use. You know, the, the, the Pharisees were out to win others to their legalistic system. But they forgot to introduce them to the living God. They got part of it, but not the whole of it. Again, on the externals instead of the internals. Let's keep going here, because this pattern is just absolutely amazing to me. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Look who's blessed. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed. They will be filled. So you're hungering for holiness here. What happens and what does Jesus point out where they're at at the end of his public ministry? Woe to you blind guides who say, whoever takes an oath by the sanctuary, it means nothing. But whoever takes an oath by the gold of the sanctuary is bound by his oath. Are you kidding me? Talk about mincing words, but they keep going on. He says, blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the sanctuary that sanctified the gold? And he doesn't stop there. Also, whoever takes an oath by the altar, it means nothing. But whoever takes an oath by the gift that is on it is bound by his oath. Notice he's getting to the heart of the matter. And he doesn't stop there. Blind people. Ah, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sacrifices the gift? Therefore, the one who takes an oath by the altar takes an oath by it and by everything on it. And he's not done yet. He's got two more verses where he's just driving this home. The one who takes an oath by the sanctuary takes an oath by it and by him who dwells on it. And the one who takes an oath by heaven takes an oath by God's throne and by him who sits on it. Here's what's, what's the danger here. Those that were hungering for holiness versus you guys who are greedy for gain. I can't about what's on the inside. And he's saying, look, you're a guide. You're supposed to be leading these people to holiness and you're taking them in to gain. You're missing the whole point. And he's just not done yet because he's got more to say. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, he's talking about those who are blessed. The merciful are blessed, for they will be shown mercy. Notice, they're obtaining mercy. But what's the Pharisees been up to? Verse 23 and 24, woe to you. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, yet gulp down a camel. What are they doing? They're rejecting mercy. They're rejecting what they should have been majoring in. Keep this in mind as you're watching this, as you're going through this, because I think this is an incredibly important lesson for us today. Stuart Webber pointed this out to me. These guys tithe everything down to the minute detail, everything that was in their pantry, even the mint, dill, and cumin, that's labeled. That's in there in, in Leviticus 27, verse 30, Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 29. And just like they were just before this with their vows and their zealous evangelism, 
This tithing served as a smokescreen. Distracting people from noticing that they had neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. They were doing the smokescreen. Take a look at all that I'm doing. Look at how I'm doing everything to the nth degree of the law, but missing out how you're missing the heart of the law, the heart of the person, the heart of the follower of the living God. You know, I hope every teacher, every one of us, because we're all teachers in some way, at some level, understand this. Whether we're parents, whether we're, um, I, I, I can come up with all sorts of, expo uh, folks, it's not about how we put up the, the, the smoke screens. It's about whether we get to the heart of who Jesus Christ called us to be. He is grieving over all of this, and he wants to make sure they understand that. But we're not done. Take a look who's blessed again in the Beatitudes in 5.8. The pure in heart are blessed, for they will see God. Here's the pure in heart. But what's going on? What's Jesus going up against? He's going up from verse 25 to 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Woe to you, blind Pharisee. Clean first the inside of the cup, so the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You're like the whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead man's bones and every impurity. On the same way, on the outside you seem righteous to people, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's why we've got some of the pictures of the tomb in the Kidron Valley. Big tombs, and they would whitewash them, but inside they're full of dead bones. Jesus is doing this, and everybody can see this. The whole side of the Mount of Olives today is filled with cemetery. And you get them in and we make them look nice, but it's, there's dead stuff on the inside. And he's saying, it's, this isn't about honoring or, or anything along those lines or proper burial procedures. It's about our hearts as living people following after God. And he says, don't get enmeshed in this because here, they're defiled in heart. And he says, that's just not where you need to be. You're like these whitewashed sepulchers. Oh, but take a look. Here in verses of, of, of uh, Matthew 5, verses 9 to 12, the peacemakers are blessed, for they'll be called sons of God. Those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And notice the foreshadowing of even Jesus. Here, peacemakers and persecuted are God's children. What are they? Woe to you. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we wouldn't have taken part with them in the shedding of the prophets' blood. You, therefore, testify against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your father's sins. And one more verse, I think. Snakes brood of vipers. How can you escape, escape being condemned to hell? Notice here, the persecutors are Satan's children. That's why he says vipers and snakes. Points out, and even as he goes on through here, about the, the, the in the verses that are to follow, we're not going to take the time today because of, of time. But he talks about from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, from the beginning 
to the end of the Jewish Bible. The organization of the, of the Bible and the scriptures in the Old Testament are different in the Hebrew Bible than they are in ours. Pointing out to the first one killed, to the last one killed in that record. But notice, he connects them to the snakes. Snakes and vipers. How can you escape being condemned to hell? And he uses the word for hell here of Gehenna. Gehenna was the Hinnom Valley, the valley that is to the west and to the south of Jerusalem, right where they're at. And in the Old Testament, in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31, in Jeremiah chapter 19, verses 2 to 6, some of the kings of Judah sacrificed their children by fire in that valley. That was desolate. That was despicable. And it was called Gehenna. And it became known as hell. This is the hell for those that are wicked. The kings of Judah did that. And notice, Jesus now con connects them right there. And to show, to understand, as we wrap up, because we've got to wrap up close, but I want you to see this and you want you to hear this because he laments over Jerusalem. This is how we know that this is about Jesus' love for them and his heart. His woe is framed in love because he cares. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. This is a lament. The city who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, yet you were not willing. They were not willing. And this image of the hen and the chicks, Moses used it in his farewell sermon. It's in the Psalms. It's in Ruth. It's bringing them in underneath to protect. Here's Jesus. He says, I want to bring you in. I want to protect you. But you didn't listen. You weren't willing. He loved them. All of this was out of the cry of his heart. He loved them so very much. But he didn't force their compliance. And he said, see, your house is desolate. Verse 38, left to you desolate. Their house is the temple. Their house is everything that they did not want to lose. They didn't want to lose the building, but they were willing to give up the living God who resided in the building. And it's left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will never see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he points out to them everything that the people cried from Psalms as he came triumphantly into the city. And he lays that before them and he walks away. And the disciples are left standing there with their mouths open. And in chapter 24, they say, Lord, when's this gonna happen? And Jesus uses this teachable moment and he shares with them what we call the Olivet Discourse. And that's what we'll get into tomorrow. God bless you. Avoid the outside. Go to the inside. In the name of Jesus, we pray.